Hi, welcome to Reading the Earth. I want to begin today by acknowledging the country that I'm on and that we're on here in the studio. We're on Yagara country in southeast Queensland. I acknowledge elders past and present and also custod ongoing custodianship for the future. Also, we want to acknowledge the country that everyone else is on today, whether it's in Australia or elsewhere in other lands, and acknowledge your elders and the knowledges of those countries, those lands too. I'm Bronwyn Fredericks, the Pro Vice-Chancellor of Indigenous Engagement at the University of Queensland. I'm pleased to say that the University is presenting this session in partnership with the World Science Festival Brisbane. When we think of science, what automatically might spring to mind might be lab coats and experiments. Most of us will also understand how the notions of objectivity and impartiality are principles of science. Words like sterility, significance and normal curves might also come to mind when we think of science, along with particular phrases. What we don't tend to consider is that Western science is a human conception. It comes from a worldview starting with Plato's cave through to Descartes' scientific blueprint through to the European Enlightenment. So that's the first idea I want to point out that is different to Indigenous science, which doesn't pretend it has the method to know everything and is able to provide generalised truths about everyone. The main focus of today's discussion is Indigenous science and our esteemed panel will be discussing that at length. In turn, the science that is Indigenous to these lands and other Indigenous peoples' lands has largely been invisible or coded as myth. Indigenous peoples are now reclaiming their Indigenous scientific methods. And so now I hope that I've cleared that a little bit off the ground and, and the ground so that we can celebrate the continued survivance and thrivance of Indigenous worldviews, science and knowledge. For today's discussion, we are joined by a panel of internationally renowned scholars and experts, both here in the studio and online. Beaming in via the link is Professor Vincent M. Diaz, who's a Filipino Fopian scholar and writer from Guam. Vince, as we call him and know him, is the chair of the Department of American Indian Studies at the University of Minnesota and is a specialist in Indigenous canoe culture and ocean voyaging in Micronesia and the native US Great Lakes. Welcome, Vince. You can see Vince okay. on the screen. Um, Joining Vince online is fifth generation Maori astronomer on a mission to disseminate star lore, left to him by his Tapuna, Te Koko and Rawadi Koko. Please welcome New Zealand's Prime Minister, National Science Communication Awardee and National Holiday Maker, Professor Rangi Matumua. Welcome, Rangi. Kia ora. Kia ora. Lastly, joining me in the studio today is Distinguished Professor of Indigenous Research, Aileen Morton Robinson, a Gunpul woman from Minjiraba and Kwandamuka. Aileen appears today courtesy of the academic partner, the University of Queensland, and welcome Aileen. Right. Let's start with you, Aileen. I'll kick off with the first question to you. So you write about and talk about um, your groundbreaking work, Indigenous Relationality. And perhaps we can start on that and you can talk a little bit about how you see Indigenous Relationality. Oh, you're a, a Bron, and I'd like to acknowledge that I'm speaking from my great-grandmother's country. She was a young little woman. Um, so relationality for me is the interconnectedness and intersubstantiveness of all things, really, um, and um, as, including rocks. It is a way of understanding that Indigenous worldviews operate through the relational and that it is not uh, human-centred in the same way that uh, Western science and other Western theories posit the human. So it, it basically um, understands that we are in relation with other kin, other living things, 
and that our knowledges in our uh, cultures are derived from relationality. So to know is to be related, to relate it is to know. I'd like to kind of give an example, I guess, of the way in which relationality operates. And I'll take Kwandamooka, which is Moreton Bay, um, my country that I, I was raised on. Uh, the example of the onion flower, when it flowers, we know that that signals mullet time is coming. Then we look at the tea trees in bloom and that gives us a reading of whether or not it's going to be a big season. So if there's lots of blooms... Lots of mullet are coming. The next thing we look for is um, Mirigimpa, who is the sea eagle. Now, she flies out, usually about roughly about 7K out. So if you follow and look, she will circle and circle and circle. Now, this will happen maybe over two days. Then we know the mullet are on the run. So then it's time to get uh, the nets ready mm. to go to harvest the food. So that there is an example of the way in which country tells us what the time is for and what's tied also to the mullet run in, in, traditionally for us was the use of the, the dolphins. So they also were part and parcel of herding um, mullet into nets. So we worked with, with our, our relatives, the dolphins, to ensure that we got the best catch. And that's, that's kind of like just a a really, you know, um, I guess, a clear view of the way in which uh, humans and the, the, the land and country are in relationship and are basically working towards a particular outcome. Yeah, that, that, and you can see that, all the, those little components, while you've said it, you know, in a, in a few short words in, re, in real time, but it's a big story. A big story. Actually, if you yeah. unpacked it. Yeah. And includes the ocean there and water. Yeah, water. Yeah. And so I'm going to turn to you in relation to water as well. When we think, when um, in thinking about the late and great Pacific theorist, Ripony O. Halfers, the Sea of Islands, um, which was an intervention and centralised way of looking at the Pacific Ocean as the Pacific way of actually viewing the world, as opposed to merely seeing the world just through islands. And that work was published 30 years ago and is really still relevant. So if you can talk about that and about the Pacific and the water, that would, that, that would be terrific. Yeah, oh, thank you, uh, Ronwen. So Apelli Haofa's essay um, is, a, is a wonderful place to start. Mm. Uh, he calls us to, to see the Pacific and its indigenous peoples in bigger, uh, more dynamic, uh, more fluidic and interconnected ways, like, like the ocean. Uh, and, and like the deep, vast uh, skies. Mm. This was explicitly tied to, uh, this view was explicitly tied to countering the ways that uh, we and our knowledge systems had for centuries under European colonialism have been belittled and romanticized or valorized in, in, in really problematic ways. And in either case, belittled or romanticized. Uh, and in terms of knowledge production, in the name of science, we were always just the objects of, um, of uh, knowledge production, never legitimate producers of it, never, ever um, understood as a possible science. And it, it, but it's important to also know that Apelli wrote another essay called Past to Remember. And I've got links, if you're not familiar with these essays, you can look at the chat, uh, links to both essays. But Past to Remember... Uh, bade us to look at our oral traditions uh, and our knowledge about m marine life, the stars, our ways of telling time, for example, or how we reckoned who we are in relation to these life forms. And, and this brings us right to Aileen's point about mm. the value of relationalities for Indigenous peoples. Um, relations of kinship mm -hmm. between us and the world around us, including uh, looking at water, sky, mm. land as inter interconnected and as relatives, uh, and that we had um, an obligation to take care of them. And then, and that obligation as important to defining who we are as people. Mm. Yeah. 
fantastic points there and that connecting back to Aileen's work. I'm going to now connect you in, Rangi, here in terms of you, your story and your examples in relation to relationality. And I know that you as a little boy through your great-grandfather um, became a scientist and also the leading Maori astronomer. But perhaps we can hear from you, Rangi, in relation to that story and, and your relationality as well. Uh, yeah, kia ora, everyone. Um, look, uh, I suppose scientist might be the mm, bit of an incorrect term to use for me. I, I, I could, didn't even get through science at school because I just saw no relationship to myself and the Bunsen burner or the periodic <laughs> table. I just didn't have a connection to that space. In fact, what drew me to science was um, w were actually some sci-fi uh, programs like Doctor Who and uh, Star Wars, and it was because of the narratives, the narratives that underpin the science was being discussed. Later on in my life, I realised that I'm the descendant of um, my ancestor, who was a, a Maori astronomer, who took the time in the late 1800s to write a very detailed manuscript of 400 pages of um, Maori star law, where he records near on a thousand stars and around 103 constellations, and narratives about each of them and also empirical science and with um in all indigenous knowledge systems the base of it is empirical science but in order to have meaning and purpose and most importantly in my mind connection to the people it was encased in these rich narratives and even woven into culture and into spirituality and religion and as an indigenous practitioner in the space i have absolutely no qualms about um, merging those spaces together because what it gives is richness and meaning to the science that is embedded within yeah. uh, within mm. the culture. And for me, you know, I just want to pick up on something about that his knowledge base and, and, and what I've inherited and continue to practice is relative to me from my cultural perspective, from my location. It's not universally Māori. It's, there are so many approaches. I mean, I came from an inland tribe that doesn't have a coastline. So our whole understanding of our environment and world is driven out of the bush, which is different to someone on the coast. And those understandings of our cultural and, and scientific practice and is, is driven from our location. And, and also, if I can say one thing, is in that manuscript, it's um, very, very clear that my ancestors' practice of science and knowledge was never, ever, ever a, a smaller study of astronomy on its own. It's littered with horticulture, agriculture, fishing, hunting, planting, um, travel, trees, flowers, birds, all sorts. And it's inter this web of interconnected knowledge where one element is only relative and important when you understand its connection to everything else. Mm. Yep, yep. Fantastic, spot on, and it connects all. You just connected in Vincent then too and and Aileen in terms of their words and um, just making me think how frustrating it must be to be in the science, you know, to be in the science space or for us to hear, all of us, each of you as individuals, but collectively um, for non-Indigenous science not to see and know um, that this is in fact scientific and dismiss it as not science. So there's huge frustration in that in terms of minimising the work. And and I know in terms of the reclamation of, you know, Indigenous knowledges and sciences into you're trying to take that into the university at the moment, that it probably brings other frustrations and that there's a, a journey um, that has to be made. And whether we have that as individuals or we take people with us is different. Aileen, we've had many discussions over the years about the academy, sometimes about the, uh, you know, fun things and sometimes about the huge difficulties with the academy. And and um, I want you to talk in, in a sense about trying to put the square in the round hole or the round thing in the square hole or, you know, the difficulty in putting Indigenous science within the Western Academy, within the university. Okay. Um I kind of want to read a little bit from yeah. what I've written, yeah. mainly because I, th I think there's some important points. And I want to sort of bring in <clears throat> or 
at least raised the issue of racism as being a big part mm. of why Indigenous knowledges are not accepted within the academy, right? So um, for me, there's two uh, cosmological frames of knowledge making in modern Western history, uh, and that's theology and philosophy slash science. And despite being in competition with each other, uh, they'll often join forces when the need arises to discredit um, forms of knowledge that exist outside these frames. Right? So we know there is resistance within the academy to embracing Indigenous science and an Indigenous scientific and social research per se. The critique of Indigenous science has usually been made on the grounds that it is metaphysical and by implication lacking rationality. Yet Western science also has metaphysical origins in Greek mythology and Judeo-Christian beliefs, which privilege human hierarchical centeredness and disconnection uh, through a connection to other worldliness. This metaphysical thinking was evident during the Enlightenment, informing Western science method in the development of a preconceptual schemata of differentiation, categorisation and classification. And classification in particular was the key scientific epistemological driver of scientific methodology. And to quote uh, Goldberg, with its categories, indexes and inventories, classification enables the ordering of data and structures observation, but it also claims to reflect the natural order of things, yes. end of quote. So classification is central to scientific methodology and its methods, which have long been taken as the ideal model of rationality, right? Mm. So in turn, rational capacity becomes the measure of humanness and was operationalised to produce a hierarchy of races. So this racial ordering was tied to white Western human behavioural expectations. And Goldberg argues that a conceptual schemata constituted by and of racialised discourse are, and I quote, classification, order, value and hierarchy, differentiation and identity, discrimination and identification, exclusion, domination, subjection and subjugation, as well as entitlement and restriction. And I argue that possession is also a part of the schemata, for in the process of classifying and identifying one, is one is producing an epistemological possession by bringing it into consciousness and naming the previously unknown, such as Aborigines, natives, right? Th those yes, concepts. Yes. So this racialised knowledge operated discursively within disciplines, moderating what can be known, who can know, and what constitutes valid knowledge by enabled by claims of objectivity, right? So through this way of knowing, the God trick is deployed. It is simultaneously the view from everywhere and to nowhere and is the arbiter of everything. Mm. Thus, the distinct metaphysical origins embedded within Western science predispose Western researchers to ways of understanding and interpreting the world. So as Native American scholar Clayton Dumont argues, and I love this, he goes, think about this. Object reality, they cannot find it. Objective research... They cannot do it. <laughs> Nonetheless, they continue to insist that, despite being beyond their reach, both are real. How can we understand this as other than a faith-based, inherited and institutionalised pursuit of a metaphysical ideal? It's I'll close brilliant, on that. Brilliant quote so, there, isn't yep, it? Yep, brilliant quote. Yep. And I can see um, Vince smiling there and um, there too. Well, I'm going to go straight to you, Vince, because... Um, in terms of building on what Aileen's has said there um, in relation to knowledge and ways of thinking, but in terms of what you do with your, you know, the, the watercraft work that you do, Indigenous watercraft, and in, you name it, Indigenous water-based ecological knowledge. So Indigenous water-based ecological knowledge, and perhaps you can elaborate that um, and, and expand that out in relation to um, your thinking around that and the worldviews of Pacific people and science and as it relates to astronomy. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, well, let me, let me uh, a, quick, uh, a quick note on indigenous knowledge as science. Yeah. To me, the verdict is still out on that one for me because, because, um, because I don't want to buy into science as the model for, yep. for uh, all that, you know? And, and I also have stakes in seeing science as a very 
specific historical social practice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and and uh, that is premised on, like like Aileen said, these these kind of metaphysical ideas about the God trick, and then it's further operationalized to use the lang- science of language uh, onto liberal secular ideas of humanism. So that's what we're we're stuck with. In contrast to that is the is what we get out of the 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 relationalities as a as an analytic. Mm-hmm. So uh, and 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 I want to I want to try to. I want to convey the the work I do around canoes um, as they are uh, embodiments of this fluidic, uh, s- almost seamless connector between people, uh, uh, sky, water, land, yeah. and other beings uh, by showing a, a quick um, a video that also happens to have been created for the um, the APT um, exhibit that's going on at uh, at uh, Queensland. Um, uh, modern art uh, art um, exhibit um, nearby over there. Thank you. So if you can uh, play that. It's called Pafu Stories. To know us properly, you need to know how we got here and how we continue to move through time and space. This is why we still value our canoes, because they connect us to how our ancestors sailed over thousands of miles of ocean, going from island to island without compasses. These abilities and more are held in our stories about stars, our oldest relatives. Stars point us to where we want or need to go, and they teach us how to tell time. We can say that stars steer us in our voyage on this canoe called Earth. Okay, and the side my love, and remember this is north, this is the northern star. I think I learned about the stars when I was very, very young, maybe in elementary school. Actually my first travel on a canoe from one island to another island was way back. I don't remember how old I was. Pafu means to look at and count stars. On a pandanus mat, shells are placed in a circle. The shells represent rising and setting points of select stars around an island or a canoe. And these rising and setting points are useful because they point toward meaningful locations around us. Tumur came during leaf and time. No more uh, breadfruit. And people were kind of hungry because they just eat uh, taro from the taro patch. No more breadfruit. It's a famine. Uh, star, and this is dying for famine. Woon means poison. So the fish are eating something that you should watch out for when you go fishing in the month of Un. At the same time, they said you don't catch a lot of uh, ocean fish in that month of Un because even the big uh, fish, they know the smaller fish they eat will be poisonous. So they, they don't waste time going out fishing. Stars are associating with uh, waves and uh, with the current. We were sailing to, from Polowa to Tamadam, and then on our way back, we were then talking stories, but one of the greatest navigator was with us. 
and he was sleeping. So he was sleeping, and all of a sudden he wake up and said, you're going wrong direction. So what? Uh, we're not heading for Bulwad anymore. And just by feeling it, he was sleeping and he feel the way, you know, his body turned around. But even the, uh, you know, the way the uh, then make himself uh, turn around, he knew, he already knew that the direction is not right. In the islands, we have a saying, the canoe is the people and the people is the canoe. How we steer our canoes, for example, sometimes you can't tell where the human body ends and where the ocean and sky begin. So too with the body of our islands, which begin from the ocean floor and are made up of currents and waves, winds and clouds, and extend all the way up to the stars. Stars that teach us everything, direction, time, seasons, and how seasons connect us to birds and to fish and to trees, like the breadfruit trees that our canoes are made from. Canoes whose own bodies connect land, water, sky, and people. For the canoe is the people, and the people is the canoe. Um, all I, all I want us to append to that is, is that, um, again, relationalities, relations of kinship and relations of uh, uh, mutual interdependence uh, through uh, mutual caring. And then and these as uh, the, the fundamentals of what it means to be a human. And so, of course, then, the kinds of knowledges that we would create would be based on these. And they would also involve uh, radically different kinds of logics, different conceptions of time, space, all of which are, are, are fundamental in how one establishes what's real, what's not, how do you understand things, et cetera. Thank you, Vince. That, um, thank you also for showing us the video and sharing that video with us here today and in the audience. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to move directly to Rangi here because I think some of the, the work you do, Rangi, would connect in with what Vince just shared and that powerful work that he shared and also the words that, that Aileen shared earlier. But I do, when I introduced you, I introduced that you were the National Award um, E for Science Communication in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And for folks who don't know, Rangi's work has also led, for the first time in New Zealand's history, to a Maori national holiday. Matariki, which begins this year, first time, and is a holiday that marks the Maori New Year. So congratulations on that um, and, and to everyone in Aotearoa. But that must have been also a really hard journey to come along in terms of making that knowledge, bringing that knowledge forward and the activism that was needed alongside of that. And I'd, and I'd like you to expand on that at this time too. Thank you. Um, I just want to say up front that I'm always um, very cautious of not trying to um, defend or describe what my knowledge base or Indigenous knowledge base is in relation to science. Yeah. Uh, I, don't, I think we need to um, be very careful about trying to justify our position on our own um, knowledge bases, because uh, for, for me, it is what it is. My practice to our understanding of everything is absolutely scientific. Vince will know better than anyone else. You don't traverse that expanse of ocean on myths and legends. It's just, it's just not. Right. You don't come to a place and implement detailed divisions of time based on lunar stellar calendar systems, which we just saw hints. And, and Aileen talked about knowing when to fish. You look for a particular haleakal star rising before the sun, position of the sun giving you season. Then you relate that to the flowering of a tree, and then you know that the fish will be moving around. Then you'll get the correct lunar phase, mm. and it all comes together because we as humans from the environment begin to connect and 
fits into the rhythms of our world and our, our environment. And that is something that sits at the heart of every Indigenous knowledge base. What we've done is we've universalised knowledge, thinking there's only one way to know. And it is, um, for me, um, you know, I just love listening to what uh, Vince and Eileen were saying because you can see so many connections. Mm. Um, and, f you know, the space that I work in in particular um, for the holiday the holiday is um, a day that follows the Māori uh, lunar uh, stellar calendar system, which has an extra month in about every uh, three years because it's part of the system of intercalation. So like we have a leap year every four years um, due to the um, way we go around the sun, uh, we do that in our Māori indigenous calendar systems because it's a lunar calendar, which is 11 days shorter than a solar year, and every three year or so years, we put in an extra month. All of these knowledge systems come into play, are embedded into the new holiday here in Aotearoa. So I think one of the wonderful things for me is the entire country, whether they're Māori, whether they're non-Māori, whether they agree or whether they disagree, have to adhere to a traditional approach to knowledge and time here in New Zealand and Aotearoa as uh, a way of marking our Māori New Year and our Matariki holiday. So I just see that sharing. It has been a journey that's had its difficulties at time when our knowledge seems to be categorised and diminished as um, you know, a bit of mumbo-jumbo, a bit of spirituality and not proper real science, and we still get that. Um, but... One of the great things I love because it is so scientific is the way that our ancestors wove our knowledge into our narratives, into our stories and into our cultural practices for it to have meaning and purpose in our lives. That for me is the key, the meaning and the purpose, because one of the biggest failures, I think, for our modern approach to science is we may know a heck of a lot more about these smaller, smaller elements or even distant planets and other galaxies. But the more we seem to know, the less we are connected to that knowledge base because it's not embedded into anything else yep. but these smaller few people that know about this approach. And it has issues like when the fact that we know we are causing our planet major harm, mm. we are heating up the planet, but because we have this disconnection to that knowledge base, even a denial of our place within the environment, we carry on doing what we've always done. And that for me is the perhaps the biggest disconnect with the way that we understand our science today. Yeah, thank you. Yep, thank you. Um, just talking about, three of you have been talking about the ways that things came about and um, those knowledge bases and the depth of those knowledge bases and how things were worked out. And I want to, at this point, acknowledge all those that have gone before us. Um, the Indigenous theorists, yeah. the Indigenous philosophers and scientists, those activists who fought to get us where we are today, that have thought those hard thinking journeys and worked out all those knowledges, that worked out the, that lunar calendar that you just talked about, Rangi, that worked out the mullet and that worked out the, the canoe uh, relationality and thinking about all of those and where we are today. In thinking about then today and looking to the future, I want to ask each of you now to think about Indigenous knowledges and those things you've spoken about now and the things you haven't. But how do you see that within the future also of science and science going forward or the academy or, or the world, indeed the world? Um, I'm going to turn to you, Rangi, straight up first this time. Um, and I've heard and I know from when I've been in Aotearoa that Sometimes, you know, well, most of the time Maoris, when they think about the future, actually turn to the past. So they flick it around, right? Um, and perhaps you could elaborate that on that, um, but also then talk about and uh, address what I, what I asked in terms of the question about looking forward um, in terms of knowledges and the academy and science by looking back. Yeah, you're, you're, you're so right. We have a saying, ma muri a muakatika, so... Um, by looking backwards into our past, we'll understand how we should approach our future. 
And actually, when we're um, referencing our time and our language, mm. um, the past can be used to reference the future, and the future can be re used to <laughs> reference the past in the context that you're applying it to. And so for me, I, I just want to make uh, this very clear to everyone. Um, I love science universally. It doesn't matter to me what science you're talking about, indigenous science, Western science. Um, I think all of this has a place in our modern world. I think the importance moving forward is the connection and the association people have with science and knowledge and how it's applied in our everyday lives. And then as an example, I think a great one is the lunar calendar system. Uh, there's massive moves here within Māori society and in tribal groups to re-establish traditional Māori lunar calendar systems. And what it is, is as we're following a universal system, this uh, Gregorian solar calendar, it's universal right across the world. We all follow the same time, and it's severed uh, an association and a relationship we have with our environment because our time's built out of our environment. And you have to sink into your environment and your lunar calendar and your stellar calendar to understand when to fish, when to hunt, when to plant. And those activities and practices reaffirm your bonds to your science and your world. And uh, as we've moved away from that, you know, we've lost in many places the ability and knowledge base that's around hunting and fishing and navigating. And it's become diminished and, and colonised and suppressed as we've pretty much been forced to adhere to a system of knowing. And so there's a movement to shift back. And what I've seen in that shift to understand our calendar systems is this desire to think about food sovereignty and uh, climate mm -hmm. uh, change and awareness of environment. And actually, it's it's informing our even our cultural practices and our spirituality. And the key to it, in my mind, the absolute key is practice. To practice, to understand our science, you need to get your hands in the soil. You actually need to get out into the environment and be part of those um, places and spaces. So I think, think for me, practice is the most important thing. And um, also the interface, I think, between indigenous knowledge systems and Western science for me is the holy grail because I think both can certainly learn from one another. Mm -hmm. And it's not about saying one is better or more important than another, but about putting them on an equal level and understanding how those um, actual approaches can work well together. Yeah. Yeah, that's we. I can see Aileen nodding at me, and I can see Vince nodding too, and I'm nodding as well. Vince, I'm going to turn to you um, because you, um, with your work around, you know, um, the canoe culture and the knowledge base and Nidjidas knowledge base in the video, and Aileen with me here, um, who's contributed to to what I'm going to say about in, in a moment, and Rangi and others in the audience today or across the world have contributed to what we know as the critical Indigenous studies. Um, and just a shout out to all those scholars that may be online today too, beaming in or who may watch the video later. We know that we have um, one of our colleagues from UQ, Professor Brendan Hokuwitu, who's um, also contributed a discussion around critical Indigenous studies, um, is online today. But that Critical Indigenous studies has really blossomed in the last 15 years or so that we now have a new generation of Indigenous scholars coming through. Um, and they now have a canon of Critical Indigenous Studies scholarship of which to follow, but also to add to, to challenge and to think about um, in their own respective areas of, of study and fields of study. What are you seeing in this space, Vince? Because you've been part of it for, for quite a while. Yeah, thank you. That that's that's awesome. Um, I'm seeing all kinds of really exciting stuff. Yeah. Um, what what critical indigenous studies uh, is very much a continuation of, um, I suppose, what we can call classic native studies now. Uh, but native studies, of course, comes out of social and political movements for sovereignty and nation building, calling for universities to be accountable to indigenous uh, experiences and epistemologies and things like that. Um, what's critical about critical indigenous studies is a level, uh, is, is at once um, uh, a customizing of uh, 
a, a new wave of um, knowledge production that was itself in in the academy critical of how power operates um, through the most uh, um, um, insidious of ways, including ways that that don't look well. Beginning with ways that don't look like. They're about power. They seem innocent and natural, like discourses about nature. So critical indigenous studies benefits from uh, um, critical traditions within academia, but customizes it. And I think customizes it with the materiality of indigenous relationalities. In fact, I think that one of the strongest um, um, developments in Native studies and why Native studies is really flourishing, uh, sometimes it makes me think of that adage, you know, be careful what you wish for, because sometimes it also seems everybody wants an indigenous, <laughs> you know, and so the, the danger of co-opting and appropriation uh, and institutionalizing uh, these things is very real. But one of the, the, the sharpest critiques, I think, that is being taken up outside of Native studies is uh, the idea of in radical indigenous, radical relationalities that come specifically out of um, indigenous feminist uh, criticism. And all, what all of these have, to have in common is a mix of, um, of, of critical scholarship, the reading, writing, um, um, uh, with a sense of um, the evidence, but as it's uh, merged with um, like what Rangi said, the uh, getting your hands in the soil, in the water, uh, in the embodied multi-sensory uh, activities of nation building, all of that. That's what is happening here. Uh, I know everybody on the stage because of uh, how this kind of work is happening across the globe and by Native people. And the fact that Native people are reaching critical mass in academia. Yeah, it's a very changing space, but at the moment, and it's going to keep changing. Aileen, your work has been at really cutting edge for a long time in terms of um, that criticality, you know, the critical Indigenous studies. And uh, you are a leading thinker, not just in Australia, but in the world. Um, I want to ask you how you see the space moving forward but also that nexus between the criticality or the activism in regards to that, in terms of Indigenous studies or critical Indigenous studies, and then also science, you know. What are yeah. the big issues that we have in, in this time, but also those scholars coming after us? Um, look, it's... Why critical Indigenous studies exists is because we have been in an epistemic battle within the academy. So, you know, to assume that we're actually sitting within the academy and there's no war going on is actually naive. So we, we are having an epistemological battle in, in, to, um, to take the ground for our knowledge. And I believe that um, and that's, that is the difficulty for us is we're up against the edifice of the Western epistemy. That's what we're up against, right? And science is, is one of the key drivers of that. And just getting back to, I guess, what Vince and I are saying, and I guess what, what, what comes through and what I've said is the body, mm. right? So Vince's idea, you can't differentiate between the body and the canoe. Right? the way in which the body is, is needed to, under, to see the stars, right? the way in which the body must uh, do things for uh, land and, and also for land to nourish. So the, the, very, the very physicality of our bodies is very much a part of our practices. Yep. And, and what we're up against is disembodiment, what we're up against is a, an episteme that still believes there's a mind-body split. Yes. It believe, and, and the other part of that, which, indigenous, which we're bringing in terms of critical Indigenous studies, is to say, but you're, you're not only are you 
you know, falsifying the mind-body split, you also have basically disassociated yourself from the earth. So it's like mind-body, earth split. Mm -hmm. That is what we're dealing with, right? Mm -hmm. And so we, as Indigenous scholars, are having to look at ways in which we can theorise to bring this enlightenment to the West so that they can kind of take a step back and go, well, this has been, you know, we are in climate change because this is really bad Western behaviour at play, right? Through the logic of capital. Wonderful thing, capitalism. <laughs> and so, we, you know, here we are in this. Climate change is real. The pandemic's real. And Mother Earth is telling us things here. First, the pandemic's reminding us that we are biological, we are not above it. We're not removed from it. We're actually these biological beings, beings right? Yeah. Yep. And that we contaminate. You know, big signal. Hello, you people are dying. You've contaminated yourselves. And we are also witnessing at the same time our slowing down because of the pandemic. Mother Earth is recuperating. Yes. Dolphins are coming into Venice, right? Whales are singing joy because the sound of the human has been reduced. And I, to me, this is, a, you know, we, we Indigenous knowledges basically is saying to me that the West really needs to step back and understand that the very mechanisms that basically have produced you and your superiority are also the very mechanisms that need to be undone, mm. right? Because your superiority means you do things to the earth and you have done things to Indigenous peoples. In fact, I would even argue that the way in which uh, the earth has been raped, extracted from, treated as though it isn't alive, is the way in which we have been placed in and of that nature and treated the same way, way yes. right? Mm. So there's logics at play there. This is what we're up against in the academy. So it, you know, it, it's not a, um, it's not a small task. No. And um, but Huge but we are making a difference, I believe, and I do. I agree. Science has been wonderful, but science itself has basically taken the body out as a feeling, touching, doing thing so that, you know, it, it has lost sight and it's lost sight of the earth. It's lost sight of the life force that actually allows it, the human to exist, right? Instead, it's done things to it. It's done things to the life force. So I'm going to be quiet now. Thank you, Aileen. Okay. That was so rich. Um, and look at, look at Rangi's face there too. <laughs> He's just loving that, hearing that conversation and Vince. We do have some time left and I'm, I'm wanting to open the panel now between the three of you raised around climate change, Aileen, and um, the connections there around the body and the humanness and ways of being human. I'm going to pass it over to Rangi and Vince to make some comment on that and maybe we can have a bit of a discussion. We do have some time um, around that. So Rangi, to you first around what Aileen's just talked about and then she's introduced then the pandemic she's introduced climate change as well um, into thinking about indigenous knowledges from those aspects and the sciences of those rangi so from a maori perspective yeah that um the the, the idea that we are not part of the environment or part of the uh, and, the uh, the ecology and 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 the rest of the environment is just so foreign mm -hmm. you know even our our understanding of our makeup we see that the trees and the birds are kin to us mm -hmm. they actually the 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 deity of those spaces are akin just like the fish and the whales and the sharks in the ocean just like um the rocks in the ground these are our kin our relations and we have genealogy to these things. So Māori, we will chant our genealogy that takes us back through a primordial origin where everything branched out from the central place. Mm. But we believe that they are our kin and we cannot know ourselves or exist or understand anything about our who we are unless we understand our connection to all of that. It's the only way it operates. And I know that, you know, um, 
many ways, you know, science will laugh and say, really, genealogy to those things? And then you go into any 101 astronomy class and they'll say, everything that makes up the air, everything you see begins its life in a star and all come from the same point of, you know, and, and it just exploded out. Yeah. And we say, well, in the beginning, you know, the sky and the earth were stuck together and they were separated apart. And, oh, that's ridiculous. And now they're telling us everything was a singularity and blew apart. Mm. If it's come from a Māori perspective and our cultural understanding of the creation of everything and our connection to everything, it's myths and legends. Yeah. But if some Western scientist says it's the Big Bang or yeah. we're all made up of stardust, yeah. it becomes science. And I think for me that is the point that irks me. Mm. Irks me because it comes from this, and I will say it, it comes from a racist, racist position mm. on what knowledge is. And then to the extreme of uh, end, then you get a whole nother level of non-Indigenous person coming in and either wanting to be the expert in the Indigenous space, right into the Indigenous space, and then tell the Indigenous people who they are. Yes. And I think that's another end of the extreme that kind of frustrates me as well, where uh, we're kind of having, you know, and, 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 and the academy lords the non-Indigenous person who becomes the expert in the Indigenous space, then it kind of gets credibility. But if it's the people who have been saying it forever, then it's still within that realm of myths and legends. I think that's a really important point uh, that all of us have a role to play in, in in making sure that we tell the world who we are, we tell the world our perspectives, and we continue to tell the world that as humans... We are the environment. We're part of it. We, it's not a resource over there that we can uh, yeah. just do what we want with. Whatever happens in, the, in, in, in our environment directly impacts upon us and our well-being and who we are. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Powerful messages there from Rangi and, and from Aileen before you, Rangi. I'm going to go across now to Vincent. Uh, Vince, for you to start comment on... Um, both what Rangi said and, and Aileen in regards to knowledge base and the future in science. And... Well, I, you know, I suppose it will surprise anybody that I, I, I agree and you probably saw me nodding enthusiastically. Yes. I also see some, some things a little differently. I think, uh, for example, the idea that... Uh, I, I think it's true that... that uh, the Enlightenment-based system is premised on a very weird kind of disembodiment. But I think it's also the case that that what what we're what we're left with, what's been produced, is a very particular form of embodied social embodied practices, but 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 couched in uh, but but in the form of say consumerism. Mm. You know, yeah. uh, and, and and we we're not so much disembodied as we are um, redirected and um, uh, reorchestrated, rechoreographed in terms of how we understand ourselves and what we do with our bodies, how we value weight certain senses over others. I think I think Enlightenment science privileges. Uh, a certain definition of visuality at the expense of other senses, yeah. uh, and Bye. and Bye. you know we have to um, we have we have to work towards uh, uh, bringing revitalizing other ways of tra training our bodies in different ways, our, our diets. Uh, uh, that's the hardest one for me. <laughs> um, decolonizing my diet. It's uh, it seems like the heart, the worse things get, the worse, the worse, the worse I eat, and that's my. That's that's the one that's been the hardest. I, I have to keep reclaiming that body uh, from the way that it's been, it's been um, 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 socialized in this system. Mm. So, so um, somewhere along the line, um, 
it's just in the same way that that much of the 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 th things we're doing for for uh, reclaiming is are are classified as revitalization rather than continuous practice. Although I don't want to hold us make a strong line between the two. Mm. So I, generally, I agree, uh, but I, I find myself um, thinking a lot about the body and the different ways that it's been. Um, organized, orchestrated, and with our with our complicity sometimes, and against our better judgment, and despite our best efforts, uh, that's the work of decolonization, uh, and uh, that's what's at stake to me in uh, critical indigenous studies and through our uh, knowledge systems. Yeah. Still a lot of work to be done, um, lots of work to be done by the scholars that are coming up after us as well. Um, and Vince, you brought in some terms there around decolonisation, and I encourage people who are booming in today to do some reading on that too and the decolonising diet. I work in the, the food space, and that's the one thing people are really you know, bringing to the fore in terms of the science, but that argument around the nutrition which splits even the, the basic food away from the body and away from the environment sometimes and sees it as separate. So for me, even personally, I gained a lot just hearing you talk in terms of some of my own own work and I'm, I'm hoping other people who have been listening today too have. I'm just going to now start to sum up now in terms of, um, you know, we've heard three fantastic speakers today, three fantastic um, panellists, um, experts, um, knowledge holders and esteemed scholars, um, Vince and also Rangi and Aileen. Um, and that it does bring us to the end of our discussion. And I hope people who have been watching in today and looking in today and thinking today, as we've been all talking and people have been responding, have learnt so much and you're going to go away and read the works um, of Aileen and read the works of... Uh, Rangi and Vince as well, as well as the other scholars that have been mentioned. I do want to thank Aileen, Vince and Rangi for joining me today and for sharing your knowledge and expertise and experience. And thank you to the people in the audience too today for tuning in to us today. Thank you. Hello, You're up.